Hello, hello, Cherie here. I'm the host and producer of Women's Running Stories. And I am really excited about the upcoming 2024 Olympic Trials Marathon happening February 3rd in Orlando, Florida. And in particular, I am going to be cheering extra loud for members of Wazelle's Year of the Underbird program. Wazelle is a by women for women athletic apparel brand rooted in running with a mission to design a great product, build the sisterhood, and improve the sport. And this Underbirds project is just another example of how they are fulfilling their mission. Last year, they chose five athletes who have been overlooked by sponsors and gave them a limited time comprehensive support package up through the trials. I featured two of those athletes on Women's Running Stories, Ari Hendricks and Brie Bomer, and Elizabeth Emery over at Hear Her Sports featured the underbird Molly Bookmeyer. The comprehensive support Wazelle is providing these athletes is a rare example of what it looks like for a sponsor to be there for the whole athlete, not just for results. And I am so here for it. Please join me and Wazelle in supporting these incredible athletes by following Wazelle on Instagram and subscribing to emails for athlete and product updates. That is Wazelle, O-I-S-E-L-L-E, and you can find them at wazelle.com. Women's running, running, running. Running stories. Running stories. Hi, my name is Michelle Sykes, and I am the author of the recently published book, Kenya's Running Women, A History. I'm also a former professional runner. I was sponsored by Nike in the years uh, after I graduated from college at Wake Forest University, where I was an NCAA champion my senior year back in 2007, I won the Women's Outdoor 5,000 Meter Championship. Yes, in this episode, you will hear the running story of former professional runner, now author, Michelle Sykes. But before we hear more from Michelle, I want to welcome you to Women's Running Stories, the podcast where women share their stories about their running experiences. I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am your host and producer, and this podcast is a proud member of the Evergreen Network of Podcasts. And before we get into the episode, I do have a little favor to ask, and that is I would love it if you would rate and review the show This helps the podcast grow. So yes, I would love it if you would rate and review the show. Thanks so much. Now on to Michelle's episode. Yes, she is a former professional runner. And back when she was in her collegiate years, she became a Rhodes Scholar and the 2007 NCAA Outdoor 5K National Champion, which you're going to hear about. It was a surprising victory and a terrific racing story all on its own. Michelle is also the author of the recently published book, Kenya's Running Women, A History. And this is, to Michelle's knowledge and also to my own, the very first academic monograph to focus on the history of any women's sport in Africa. And in Michelle's episode, you're going to hear how these two accomplishments, the 5K championship and this book, are inextricably linked. It's also noteworthy that Michelle was coached by women all the way up through her first year as a pro, which is almost her entire running career. And speaking to that topic for just a second, just as I was making this episode, Allison Wade of the Fast Women Newsletter published a story titled Long Hours, Poor Pay, Discrimination, Why the Number of Women in Collegiate Coaching Remains Low. And she starts off by saying, In 2023, women held only 18.3% of the head women's cross-country and track positions across all NCAA divisions. I'll link to the story in the show notes. 
But what I'm getting at here is that women running coaches are really important for the sport overall, but also specifically for women runners. And Michelle's story speaks to that very directly. So let's get into it. Let's hear Michelle Sykes' running story, starting with how she got into the sport to begin with. Here to tell her story is Michelle Sykes. I got started in running as a freshman in high school. Prior to that, I had played soccer and basketball, and I love sports, and particularly soccer. I, I was a center midfielder, so not too skilled, but just ran around most of the game and kind of developed some endurance capacity there. And I was lucky enough as a freshman to be noticed by the coach at my high school, and she really encouraged me to switch over from soccer to track and to cross country. And I had also, fortunately, some some of my really good friends were cross country runners at that time. So I took it on as a freshman in, in high school and just blossomed over the course of, of that season and finished 10th at the state meet in Ohio. The It's held at Scioto Downs, or it was in those days, a big horse race track where you start in front of a grandstand filled with, you know, throngs of people, cheering crowds, and you finish, you, you go out for a couple miles and you come back in and you finish in front of that group as well. And uh, just was an outstanding experience, my first ever state meet. And uh, that kind of set me off on a really uh, good foundation to continue to enjoy and embrace running. And I competed as well in track my freshman year and also competed at the state meet then. I, I was a state champion my freshman year and finished second in the mile, first in the 3,200 meters. And in the course of my high school career, I, I ended up being a two-time All-American I, I raced uh, twice at the what was then the Foot Locker Cross Country Nationals, and so it was my senior year when I became an All American in Cross Country, and I finished 14th. So just made just made the cut there, and I also became an All American in track in high school when I I was able to race at the at the national meet my junior year, and uh, I. I I believe my best mile in high school was something like a 451, but that was enough to get me noticed by um, by by college coaches. And I went on some visits to different places around the country, but I loved Wake Forest. I was fortunate to have a, a wonderful recruiting trip there, and importantly, the coach of Wake Forest track and field and cross country teams uh, was a woman. Her name is Annie Bennett, and I had been coached in high school also by a woman, and I really appreciated the chance to continue to to have a strong female role model to look up to in college, and she was such an energizing, inspiring person that I, I really was excited to get to work with her. And she, at the time, was one of very few, I mean, you know, less than 5%, I think, of NCAA college coaches at the Division One level who held the title of director of both the men's and women's track and field and cross-country programs. And so she was a real leader in all sorts of ways. Coach Annie herself was a an NCAA 5,000 meter women's outdoor track and field champion. In get this wrong, 1985, she won. She was a, a she competed for the University of Texas at Austin. She herself is a Texan, and she was one of the pioneers of women's distance running in this country. And so I think it, it was something really cool. It, it was pretty much you know. 20 years later that I won my championship after she won hers. And she is a, you know, was a, the 5,000 meters was her specialty in college. And then it, you know, was mine as well. And, but she was doing it at, at the era, during the era when Title IX was really just finally becoming enforced. And so Title IX at the law requiring equal funding at all federally funded institutions for uh, men's and women's 
activities, including sport. And so that passes in 1972, but it then is contested through the courts for more than a decade. And some programs do start to institute women's sport pretty soon after 1972, but not the, not the vast majority. And it's really not until the 80s, the mid 80s, that we do start to see the, the spreading of the programs in the way that now we're so accustomed to seeing women's sport at every university. And it's not a question. But back in, in the mid 80s, when my coach was running early 80s, she would have been right at the cutting edge of these these new programs and new events and um, new ideas about women competing at a high level and the training that, were, that was required to what women could do with their bodies and what would be acceptable as a woman in college. And um, so she was, she was absolutely fearless. And she, she took that kind of spirit with her into the coaching ranks and continued to just break down all sorts of barriers by virtue of doing what she loved, which was running in a space that was a male dominated one. So I think just really appreciating that that history and understanding what she what she had to do to get to where she was by the time she coached me. I, I've come much more in the fullness of time to appreciate all that, but I definitely got it right when I met her because she has such a strong personality and magnetic one that you you want to believe in what she's doing and what she says and that it, you can think, do things that you never thought you could. And so I chose to go to college at Wake Forest. And that's in North Carolina. So I, I went to Wake and had, again, another period of growth and blossoming. It had its ups and downs. When I, when I first got there, I had a, a really good cross-country season. I was the ACC Rookie of the Year and I came in and was able to make the varsity team at, uh, at my team at Wake, which at, at the time was a, a very competitive team that qualified for the NCAA Cross Country Championships. And to be a scorer and make a mark in, in my first year in college, I was really proud of that. But it was really the fall of my junior year that I had a big breakthrough. I sort of suffered some niggles and injuries as I came into my, my freshman year track and field season um, in college. And the so I, I didn't hit maybe some of the times I was hoping to that year. And then sophomore year kind of came coming, getting stronger and stronger. But I think finally what clicked for me was I, I hadn't run seven days a week in until I got to college. I always took a day off in, in high school. I only ran 30, 40 miles a week in high school. So it was, uh, you know, it took my body, I'd say, a solid two years to adjust to the higher mileage, the close to seven days a week running. There would be the odd day off with a swim or something, but, you know, much more running and just the intensity of the racing and the travel and college and life and all that. And so by the, all, all that took, I'd say two years. And then uh, my junior year was when I really started to see some breakthroughs in terms of getting faster. And I was able to qualify for the outdoor track and field championship for the first time as a junior. And I did compete in the women's 5k at that point. And I think that was really helpful for ultimately then coming back as a senior and winning the race because I had been there once before. I had gotten out of my system. The star struck, oh, wow, I'm here. This is just amazing to be lining up at the national meet and being a part of this incredible moment, at which it, I still held that as a senior. But when I came back as a senior, I was more confident and I could, I could picture it in my head what it was going to be like. And I was more determined to make more of it than I could have done the first time around. And so that junior year, seeing really good progress uh, in outdoor led into my best cross country season as a, as a senior. And I won the pre-nationals meet. Pre-nationals is, except for the national cross country meet, it's the biggest meet of the year and it brings most teams across the country into into contact with each other and there's usually two different races and i won my race against there were some 500 women in the race and so that was a really big moment to to have made it to 
but it's also mid season and everyone's in heavy training and it isn't, it doesn't have the qualifying around. It's not, it's not winning a national meet, but it's definitely giving you a sense of like, wow, I, there's something here. But then the, what happened with, with the national cross country meet my, my senior year was that I was then a finalist for the road scholarship and had the opportunity to interview for that in Pittsburgh. Of course, that was the same weekend as the NCAA cross country championship. And in those days, <laughs> the cross country championship was scheduled for actually the Monday after uh, the Thanksgiving. I think that's what it was. And, and so it was the weekend before the Monday race when I was in Pittsburgh interviewing for the Rhodes Scholarship. And the Rhodes interview was a a whirlwind, a fascinating, intense, wonderful experience. And I had to then fly not with my team to Terre Haute, which was where the cross country championships were taking place, but but I flew on my own from Pittsburgh and met them there. So that was my that's my sort of cross country story of my senior year in college. I finished, I think, 14, 16th or 14th, something like that. I, I didn't finish as high as I, I wanted to, but I did make All-American, which was my goal. Michelle had met her racing goal after that intense weekend of interviewing to become one of two people chosen to receive a Rhodes Scholarship. And what that meant, what she was getting through the Rhodes Scholarship, was several years of funding to pursue her graduate degree at the prestigious Oxford University in the UK. But before she started making those future plans, she had her final season of racing outdoor track as a collegiate athlete and an NCAA national title to go after. And I will tell you, I never imagined I could actually win an NCAA championship, which I was able to do through through Annie's coaching. She she was a master of tactics. He really, really understood how to guide people to race well, not just to practice well or to record fast times, but to compete against other women. And in the, my case, the story of the championship that I won, it was the final race of my collegiate career, outdoor track and field championship. And the most highly touted runner at the time in the country it was a woman named Sally Kipiego. And she that year had won NCAA titles in all the long distance events. So she'd won the cross country, uh, she'd won indoor and outdoor 3K, 5K, and she had just won the 10K outdoors at the NCAA meet. And that, though, is where Annie's brilliance came into play because she watched how Sally Kipiego competed in that 10K. And that the 10K took place before the finals of the women's 5K. And the way Sally won that 10K was by controlling the race at the front. She was always right there with the leaders. But as soon as she could, she went to the front and she slowed the pace right down. And so that and everyone was knew how outstanding Sally was. Everyone was keying off of her because she was the best runner in the, in the country at the long distances. And so she really just controlled the tempo of the six point two mile race throughout. And I think it was a smart move by Sally because Sally was doubling. She was trying to win both the 10K and the 5K at the uh, outdoor track and field championships that year. And Sally had also just competed in the prelims of the 5K to qualify for the finals. And she had won her heat and I was not in her heat and I had won my heat. So I, I, I felt very comfortable winning that, that prelim heat I felt like I was floating on air. I, it's one of those really just races that you don't get very often in your life, but I was able to just just kind of fly through the, the prelim, and I knew I'd held back a lot. And my, my best times in the 5,000 meters were nowhere near what Sally had run by that point. I had, I'd only run a 15.45 was my best. Best, and that was an indoor, my indoor 5K, which I finished third that year at the indoor championships. So, yeah, coming into the final of the 5,000 meter at the outdoor national championships, Michelle's PR was over 20 seconds slower than Sally Kipiego's. And Sally had just reset her PR a few months earlier at the Mount Sac relays, running a 15 minute, 19 second 5K. In other words, Sally was in top form. 
On paper, Michelle really wouldn't have been a consideration for the win, but she and her coach saw things a bit differently. I had clear, I had reason to think that my PRs um, did not reflect the shape I was in. And so part of the confidence all came from what I was doing in my workouts at the time. And also um, to qualify for the NCAA championship that year, you, you had to race at the regional championship. And the way Annie had me do that was she said, just, you know, go with the pack for the first 2K, just whatever pace they're running, go with it, and then race the last 3K and race it for as hard as you can and just see what you can do in in that final 3K. And I I ran something close to nine minutes for the last 3K in that. What ended up, but it didn't look like that fast because the first 2K had been slow. So I knew that I had it in me to run a, a quick time like that if several, you know, three, two or three weeks before the NCAA championship meet. And so, but that wasn't visible in terms of the final time that I had recorded. And so to the outside world, it didn't, it didn't appear that I maybe had this capacity to, to go places I had far, far faster than I had done before. And so I was kind of under the radar. Nobody, I think, really expected there to be a challenger to Sally. If there were to be one, it might, it was, certainly wouldn't have been me. Molly Huddle was uh, competing that year, and she'd come through some injuries. Um, but there were, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of good women in the field. So back to Annie and her strategic brilliance. So she, Annie, coached me the night before the outdoor 5K final that what I had to do was not allow Sally to dictate the tempo. I had to be resistant to that. And if Sally tried to slow it down, I needed to go to the front and pick it back up again. And as it happens, Teresa McWalters from Stanford was in the race and she did me a a huge service by taking it out at at a strong pace for the first one, two K. She was willing to not let this settle into a a kicker's race at the end. She made it honest from the start. And that let me sort of settle in, get comfortable with the group. But after 2K, that that's when Sally and I and a few others did start to separate from the pack and we're leading the group. At 3K, Sally does begin to try to slow the tempo down. And so it's really a 2K race from that point. And every time Sally did did try to slow slow our group at the front down, I took the lead and would hold on to that for a little while. And then Sally would come up on my shoulder and she would uh, try to take the lead back from me. And so by at some point, it, we lose everyone. And it's just the two, she and I, battling back and forth. And Diego with the best collegiate time this year, 15-19-72. And Sally Kipiego regains the lead from Michelle Sykes. It's pretty surprising because, and look at this, they're going back and forth. It's pretty surprising because Kip Yeager is usually happy to, to follow, but take a look at Michelle Sykes back into the lead. Back and forth. And she'll take the lead and hold on to it for a little while, until, which I was happy to have her do until she, I felt her trying to slow the pace down, at which point I took the lead. And we played this sort of cat and mouse game. And then the final 500 meters comes and there's this moment in the back straight where I take the lead for a final oh, I think that last pass might have been enough. It looks like Kip Yeago may not have a response to the last time that Michelle Sykes has passed her. Sally Kip Yeago was trying to make history, looking for a clean sweep, but right now it is Michelle Sykes who wants to write her own story, Dwight. We're coming up towards the, the 400 meter mark, basically, and I could hear the crowd and there was this roar and I just pushed and I looked behind me a few seconds later and I saw that there was, I couldn't see her, there was daylight and I realized I think I've broken her and I I can't describe that moment was like a miracle I just flew down the back straight around the around the bend looked back again nowhere in sight and at that moment I knew I was gonna win this championship and then I I come home into the straightaway and the the all I can hear is the crowd yelling I'm I'm absolutely um just on cloud nine and Michelle Sykes 
Josh Scholar from Wake Forest takes the title in the women's 5,000 meters. Best time this year. 15, 16, 75, and it's a new meet record for Michelle Sykes. She outlasts Sally Kipiego. And Sykes with the And, and across the finish line, my coach is there, my parents are there, and I, I just, even to this day, get goosebumps thinking about how it still came true that I had won this race and definitely the best race of my life. So that was all thanks to Annie's tactics and making sure that I didn't, I didn't sit and I didn't just coast. And, and I ended up running a 15, 16. So something like a 30 second PR in the 5k lifetime best. And that's purely a fact, again, thanks to Teresa and keeping the pace honest that it was a pure uh, guts race. It wasn't a sit and kick race. It was to see who can, who can race this thing from start to finish. And I wouldn't have had, I don't think the conviction to do that if my coach hadn't said, look, this is how you have to, if you want to win this, this is how you have to race this. Michelle had done it. She had finished off her collegiate career with an incredible win. Racing hard and smart, she went for it and was able to do what few others had, come in ahead of Sally Kipiego, who herself would go on to medal at the Olympics in the 10,000 meter as a member of the Kenyan Olympic team. And then she raced the Olympic marathon in 2021 as a member of Team USA. Coming in third in that race was Molly Huddle, who herself has also been a two-time Olympian. And... In that 5K, Michelle not only set a big PR for herself, but she also bettered the NCAA meet record by more than 15 seconds. And that record had been held by Lauren Fleshman, a multi-time NCAA champion who went on to also earn two national titles as a pro. So yeah, this was a huge performance. After graduation, Michelle negotiated to postpone her graduate studies for a year. She secured a sponsorship with Nike and continued to be coached by Annie Bennett at Wake Forest. And then with the move to Oxford the following year, she continued to compete as a pro, but also the role that running played in her life began to shift. When I got to Oxford, this very, um, you know, world-renowned institution. And I sort of thought, well, what can I bring to the table that I know very well and can let me sort of thrive here and also that I'm interested in and want to learn more about and I'm passionate in? And the only answer for me at that time was running. And in particular, it was racing Sally in my final race as a senior in college that championship that made me want to go to Kenya and experience the what life was like running in the Great Rift Valley I'd read about. And um, so I was lucky because I had some wonderful advisors at Oxford where I studied economic and social history, which is just a very broad interdisciplinary approach to history, who were willing to let me study the and support my studies of the history of the pioneer generation of women distance runners in Kenya. And I had done some reading around this topic and found lots of interesting things about the history of what men distance runners had achieved. And I wanted to know what the women, what were, where were the women and what had they done and how had they navigated their challenges and obstacles and how, uh, what were those obstacles and how did they overcome them? And so that was the, when I settled on that as a, as a project, I was then compelled, lucky enough to go to Kenya in order to find the answers to those questions. And I could also train there. So I stayed at Lorna Kiplagat's High Altitude Training Center, which is in the very famous running hub of Iten, just outside of Eldoret in the highlands of Kenya, around seven, 8,000 feet up. And it's a base for lots of international runners. There were top runners from the UK, from the United States, from Canada. And so uh, it was a really, really wonderful chance to, to get to learn from and, and get to know runners from all around the world while also then going out 
and interviewing the the women who were at the forefront of running in Kenya. And and here I've got to give a, a key shout out to Godfrey Kipritich because he was essential when it came to his network and, and sharing his network of people and introducing me to, to these fantastic uh, women who were so, so gracious to me and, and shared their stories with me. So that is, that's how I, I then eventually came to write the book, uh, Kenya's Women Running a History, which is based on my PhD dissertation, which I had written uh, based on the research that I did in Kenya. I came back incredibly inspired by the women who I was able to speak with, and then that matched with what I had come to learn about women in this country, the United States, just just the, the pioneer generation of women runners around the world who ran at a time when it was not acceptable. It was very weird for women to be out doing such such crazy things as going for runs on their own. And that we today have what we have because we have these generations that came before us. I think, I, I mean, that was what my research project was. And that's definitely something I feel grateful to have got to be able to understand at such a a granular deep level through through the, the process of producing that work. And so I think it's something I hope we don't forget. And uh, maybe a cliche, but history matters. I hope that I have a son. His, his name is Henry. He's 10 months. Um, he'll be hearing about the achievements of the women that came long before me. But if I have a daughter someday, I will also impress on her the the history that we're all part of and we're all here because of. That does bring us to the end of Michelle Sykes' running story on the podcast. I want to thank Michelle so much for coming on the podcast and sharing her story. And I also want to thank fellow runner, podcast pal, and my friend Jenna Spinelli for introducing me to Michelle. Thanks, Jenna. And also, thank you to Michelle for writing this terrific book, Kenya's Running Women. It is a really interesting read and a much-needed addition to the history of sport. And it is immediately going to make an impact because Michelle is currently an assistant professor of kinesiology, African studies, and history at Penn State. And this summer, she's going to be teaching an African sport history class and Kenya's running women will be part of the curriculum. Like Michelle said, history matters, which means that documenting history is really important. When we don't know the stories, we lose out on understanding how our world developed and very importantly, who helped shape it. Of course, I will link to how you can get your own copy of Kenya's Running Women. And I'm also going to link to the Women's Running Stories episode about Sally Kipiego. She tells a great story about how she made the 2021 U.S. Marathon Olympic team. And I will link to the two WRS episodes featuring Molly Huddle. The most recent story is about how things went down for her at the New York City Marathon and what she has coming up. And I can tell you one of the things that she has coming up is she will be racing in Orlando, Florida at the 2024 Olympic Marathon Trials, which are happening in just a few weeks on February 3rd. Thank you so much for being here, for listening to this episode. I really appreciate it. And as a reminder, I would also love it if you would rate and review the show. Thank you so much. That is going to do it for me. I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am the host and producer of Women's Running Stories. And until next Friday, I do wish you healthy women's running. running. Women's Running Stories. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. 
In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.